six months ago as we got excited for another international break. The same old complaints started flooding in. So, we took you with the ultras of Bosnia and Montenegro to show you what the international break really looks like. Many of you saw the light, but some of you still weren't convinced. So we took you 10,000 kilometers west amongst the color and energy of North and Central America to once again show you what the real international break looks like. More of you got on board, but it seems like some of you still don't get it. So now, two months later, 14,000 kilometers back east, as 60 matches are played across five continents in six days, we've brought you to the world's biggest continent with football's fastest growing community, where the way of life is nothing like the last few destinations. And so we begin our Asian journey here in Tokyo, Japan. Home to the continent's biggest, most popular, most successful nation, Samurai Blue, who whenever they play here for World Cup qualifiers, have an incredible effect. World Cup qualifiers always for Japan are extremely important. Oh God, it's crazy. 500,000 people try to apply for ticket. It's huge. You can't imagine the support for this national team. This is Japan. However, despite the mammoth effect this sport, and in particular this national team has had on Japan, you only have to go back a couple of decades to see a very, very different sporting landscape. In the late 80s, Japan had barely any spectators at football games. Baseball reigned supreme. It had all the media attention had all the coverage, had everyone following their teams. It's, it was part of culture. Baseball was the number one. Because my father or my grandfather, you know, everyone was like, was, you know, watching the game of the baseball. So baseball is a reflection of a common way of life in Japan. It's about being in that company and giving all your best. In Europe and in South America, you have clubs that are based in cities and towns and communities, and they represent those communities. Whereas in Japan... All of the teams are company-owned. So, for example, Yomiuri Giants is owned by the Yomiuri Company. That's an, an inherent part of Japanese culture that doesn't really translate out west. The working life in Japan is all about one company, one, one life. So you are dedicated to that company. People would uh, associate themselves with that company. I am Chris from Toyota. I am Chris from Nissan. You put on the same black suit and white shirt and the tie, briefcase, the everything you work hard for. You have to be at the office at 9 o'clock, which really means 8.50. You're getting on the train during rush hour, and that's just a nightmare. Look at the crowd at a baseball game. It's all white shirts and loose ties, because everyone who goes to these games is coming out off the workday. With baseball so intertwined with corporate culture, the JSL, Japan's league at the time, which was amateur, never really had a chance. You had the JSL, the Japan Soccer League, which was struggling for spectators. The quality of play was average at best. It wasn't big enough to, to capture the mainstream attention. And if the domestic scene was in a bad shape, the international scene was far worse. Japan had to struggle to get friendlies with Malaysia and Thailand. The national team couldn't even really make the World Cup. They tried as hard as they could, they could never get there. It seemed like football in Japan would forever play little brother to baseball. However, four years later, it changed, thanks to a trio of events that created the perfect storm. So in 1993, the perfect storm for Japanese football happened. You want to think of where Japanese football was then, it would have been massive. Firstly, a man by the name of Tom Bai introduced his technical teaching program across the country. I was the first foreigner to ever step on the pitch here. Got out of playing. I fell in love with Japan and I wanted to stay here. It's probably one of the best places in the world. The service, the, the cleanliness, the safety, the food is unbelievable. I saw that there was an opening because, you know, kids needed to be better technically. He was in magazines, he was on daily TV shows. He basically transformed grassroots coaching in Japan. I introduced the, 
the concept of focusing on technical skills. So with his technical teaching, he created a factory line of technically superior Japanese football players. I hadn't known that Kagawa was actually in some of my events until he told the story to someone else. Secondly, the JFA launches their bid for the 2002 World Cup. Japan threw their hat in the ring to become the World Cup hosts, and the country was just going crazy. And thirdly, the J-League starts in 1993. The enthusiasm, the amount of media coverage, they basically wanted to try to promote the teams to try to move away from that corporate identity. And Jay Lee came out and said, well, you can't do this company name thing. You have to take a hometown, you have to pick a home region, and you have to run with it. Nissan becomes Yokohama F Marino, Tokyo Gas FC becomes FC Tokyo. And that was actually the key to the success of the league, wasn't it? Absolutely, because you had that growth of hometown pride. First match of the J-League started, more than 300,000 people tried to apply for tickets. With international World Cup stars playing for teams that represent cities instead of companies, playing in front of sold-out crowds making this noise, and with a very good chance of hosting the World Cup in a decade, it seemed like football in Japan was only on the However, the sport still faced one last obstacle on the international scene where the national team had still never made a World Cup. we never be on the World Cup. It was like a huge shame. Riding this new wave of football support after the perfect storm, the Samurai Blue had the chance to rid this international issue with the USA 94 World Cup qualifiers. In a round-robin qualifying tournament held in Doha, Qatar, where two out of six spots got to make the World Cup, this was Japan's best chance at finally making the tournament. Instead, it became the agony of Doha. It was brutal. Uh, they were just one game away. Most traumatic football game for all Japanese football fans. Just one goal that, that cost them everything. Going into the game, Japan was top, Saudi Arabia was second, and South Korea third. Now, what's the most about it? I was at a friend's place, I had a bottle of champagne. So Japan was fine as long as South Korea and Saudi Arabia didn't win. Like, I think all the football fun was nervous about it. But they did. So Japan had to win. They were. And I was on the phone calling the general secretary of the U.S. Soccer Association. Until. Calling him to say we're coming, and then. Like, kind of, like. That goal was scored. The secretary was getting him and I just hung the phone up. <laughs> Iraq equalized in the final minute, which saw Japan drop to third, meaning their dream of a first ever World Cup was put on hold for at least another four years. And the manner of the result was so traumatic that if you say the word Doha to the Japanese still today, Doha, mm -hmm. we know. It, look, it, it still hurts the Japanese. Mm -hmm. yes? mm -hmm. Like sticking a knife inside you. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't go to school or you know go to, go to for work. Fast forward four years, and the good news was Japan had won the right to host the World Cup alongside South Korea. The bad news was while South Korea had made the last few World Cups, Japan still had never made one. And if they didn't qualify for France '98. By 2002, they'd be the first team to host a tournament without ever actually qualifying for one. So in 1997, Japan had to qualify for the France 98 World Cup. Whilst active support had been the integral key to the success of the rise of the J-League, over on the international scene, the national team, despite a new following, couldn't create the same kind of atmosphere until a shaggy-haired kid from Tokyo decided he was going to change that.俺が応援してると選手がみんな、おお、また来たかみたいな友達だったんだけど、どんどん一人で応援するより仲間を巻き込んで何かしたいと思った時、俺が向こうにイングランド行った時に日本とサッカーの状況が違うっていうプレーの
Then in the 118th minute, the keeper parries to his left. Okano comes rushing in. Just like the agony of Doha four years earlier, the match was decided by a goal in the final minutes. But this time, the result went the way of the Samurai Blue. And for the first time ever, Japan were in a World Cup. We were like bursting, crying, people screaming. That was crazy. It was crazy. Sugoku. いけないと思った瞬間には本当に背負わって泣かないで4年後絶対フランス行くぞなんて言ってたけども、たまらなくあれだったね。それ僕だけじゃなくてアパート中みんなアパート中のみんながすごく大きな声を上げてみんな同じ
here's where things get tricky because usually on the Rural International break, we join the home side, but this time the away side, Australia, that's my side. The team I love and adore the most in football. And it's actually kind of full circle being here because I came here exactly four years ago. It was the penultimate game. We needed a point to make sure we go direct to the World Cup and avoid a very tricky playoff. And to be back, well, I can't lie. Unlike usual, I'm joining the away end and you're going in with the home end. And for the first time, we're going to be catching a few very different experiences of Asia's biggest qualifier. <laughs> 